Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, it is really good just to be back. You guys had quite a hectic uh, December. We've had a good December, been here, there, and kind of everywhere. But it is really good just to come back with all the church folk, church family, and hear you guys, hear what's been going on. Um, yeah, there's kids' packs up the back, just kindly provided by the Martins. So, obviously, Sunday school isn't on during the holiday, so if kids want to go and grab one of those, and maybe the kids that are in the know give a pack to the kids that are relatively new. That might work well as well. Uh, we're going to be hopefully just having a bit of a look at Philippians shortly. Uh, so if you want to open roughly to Philippians 3. But just wanted to ask you guys, it is that time of the year, isn't it? New Year's resolutions. I've got 44 years worth of resolutions. I don't think I made too many in my early years, but I've made a fair few since then. And I'm sure all of you have as well. And it's kind of funny this time of year. There's just something about the earth completing its cycle around the sun and a new year starting that kind of makes us go, well, what's going on in my life? What things perhaps need to change? What things do I need to set as goals? And you hear a lot of that kind of stuff on the radio, on the TV. Here's a kind of summary of the top 10. So I won't go through all of them, but <coughs> helping others, getting out of debt, more family time, losing weight. A lot of these you'll notice are actually old year failures. New Year's resolutions are old year failures. Like, um, Anyway, and that's, that's probably good that you're aware because sometimes we're not even aware of those fires. But anyway, so that's sort of the top 10. Uh, quit smoking, exercise, all those kinds of things. Um, maybe it's just that one. This year I will be awesome. A bit like Jack Black on it. Awesome. Kung Fu. I don't want Kung Fu on the way home. I will just be awesome. Uh, the problem is, is this, and we went through this at the start of last year as well. Only 8% of people actually achieve their New Year's resolution. So let's say there's about 50 people here. My calculations are that only 46 of you, sorry, 46 of you will fail. Only four of you will, will pass and achieve your New Year's goal. So whatever they are, that's a little bit of a sobering kind of fact because that means there's a 92% a chance that you're going to have another New Year failure. Um, now it's kind of funny in a way, but then we look at stuff like this and whatever the resolution is, whatever the goal is, we look at scripture and it presents itself as a goal, doesn't it? Let's read together. It's Philippians 3, verse 12. Paul's writing this from prison. He's in jail. It's at the end of his life, which Peter did and said so well, probably about Peter's age. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, in verse 13 now, Chapter 3, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul should be an old, grouchy, bitter, twisted old man, unhappy with the Jews, unhappy with the churches, that so many of them let him down, and yet he says, I Press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. How could he possibly say and achieve that when we know from our science and statistics that only 8% of people achieve their New Year's resolutions? Because what's really sad for us when we read a verse like that, which is kind of cool, it's a, it's a typical New Year's verse, isn't it? A typical New Year's, has, has someone heard a sermon on this before? Pressing on towards the goal? Yeah, maybe not on New Year's, but it's there. It's quite a famous passage. Well, just consider that for a moment. Four out of 50 are going to succeed. Now, if we were purely looking at it in a human perspective, that's pretty sad, sad kind of odds for the kingdom. That's pretty sad for us. Why is it that for most people, they fail in their New Year's resolutions? And, and perhaps why is it that we fail oftentimes in our own kingdom resolution? That's, that's the question. Today, well, some might say they just didn't try at all. Who cares about New Year's resolutions? Who cares about any resolutions? Just got to kind of rest and take it easy and, you know, stay in the lounge room the whole time. Other people might say, well, you did try, but you just didn't try hard enough. And in fact, I reckon most sermons that you hear about New Year's, and in fact, probably most sermons that you hear, all revolve around telling you you've got a problem and then telling you to try harder. So I'll just sit down now. So why go through all the fluff and the poetic kind of license and the preaching and the 
you know, the homiletical side, you know, what, what, by the way, why don't I just say, try hard, everyone? Well, I've been thinking a lot, a lot about this and, and one of the things I struggle with all through my Christian life is why don't I want to do what God wants me to do? Why don't I want to love God, love Jesus, love the Holy Spirit in a greater sense of fullness and reality? Why am I so easily distracted? Why am I so easily thwarted in my often noble aspirations to follow Jesus? Try harder, Adrian. Well, I want to try harder right now because we together in church and we had some great songs and great sharing time. This is a new, but I know come March, this whole try harder thing, it doesn't even matter to me. Why? Why is that? Look at those again. I, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. But then by March, it's like, no, okay, now it's busy. I've got the mortgage to pay off. I've got kids to take care of. Or, you know, I've got work. I've got even church is getting in the way. I've got school commitments. You know, why? Why, why has it become irrelevant to me all of a sudden? Well, Typically, in theological circles, when we talk about effort, theologians have talked about two main camps. One is the legalistic camp. The other is the what they call libertine camp. I'm not going to use those terms, but that's pretty much where I'm going if you're in the know. So there's two ways of looking at why we don't achieve things. And Sandy sent me a letter which really brought home, I think, some of the sentiment of this, and I've asked her permission to read bits of it and I'm just going to read it to you, and I think many of you will look at it and you'll go, yep, I kind of empathise. And so she's called it, Is There a Third Room? Once upon a time, I joined a whole bunch of Christians in a place where they all seemed to feel it's a place where Christians ought to be. It was like a house which only had one room. In that room, all the Christians tried to follow all the rules which seemed to be directed towards Christians, like read your Bible, pray, go to church, do good deeds, live a moral life. My word, try harder. Try harder. We were never good enough. The scriptures describe it as living a form of godliness without power. In First Timothy 3, 5. And I describe it as trying to live in the spirit by the power of the flesh. As I spent longer in that room, I, like most of the others, developed a critical spirit and a sad face. No one was following all the rules and neither was I. We were all good. Um, what do you got? Does that do you empathise with some of that? Like, do you ever feel in your Christian experience and in church that that's what it's all about? You know, yeah, yeah, we talk about grace, talk about following Jesus and being in love with Him, but ultimately, I put more chairs out today than you. You didn't put enough chairs out. I'm looking down on you. Put more chairs out. Show that you're serving. Try harder. And when you do try hard and you have a bit of success, that's what happens. You look down on the other person who hasn't put as many chairs out as you, or hasn't done morning tea as many times as you. That's what we could call room number one. And room number one, when they look at, I press on towards the goal, the view from that room is simply, I just need to try harder this year. And there's always elements of truth to this stuff. But what tends to happen is these sort of strong irresistible tendencies towards self-righteousness and judgmentalism, and that's why you end up with a sad face. You're not succeeding, you're not happy, and no one else is either. Now, Paul, as he writes at the end of his life, reflects on when he was a room one. Just turn with me there to Philippians 3, it's just previous in the chapter. He is talking here about room one guys, the Pharisees the legalists, what I'll call the lawlings. And he, he points out that he had more reason than anyone else to gloat and boast in the fact that he was a great room oneer. Verse 4 of chapter 3, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, so that's in self-strength, self-righteousness, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day. That was all part of the law back then. He was, boom, right on, the, right on time. He was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. So he kind of saw himself as this righteous warrior that was making good the character of God by picking on the church. He was zealous for God. 
As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So he, in his own words, according to the law of Judaism, had been righteous. He was a great room oneer. But what was the problem with that? Well, he was doing heaps of things. He had a mental checklist, a yardstick of what's right and what's wrong, made sure that he measured up. I'll call this the workroom. Okay? This is the workroom. If we're going to use the house metaphor, it's the workroom. This is the workroom where everyone's working hard towards the goal. And I put in big letters or big font there, I, because it is all about I press on towards the goal. I work hard. I do this. I do that. And again, in and of itself, it seems like such an innocent thing. But here's the issue. There is a high-impact train smash or aeroplane smash at the end of this. Jesus describes legalism, lawlings, this one. I'm not saying that that's where we're at. I'm just saying that this is a tendency that we all have and it will be a fight probably that we have all our lives and we will need the power of the Spirit to be self-aware because most people, when you tell them, look, or preach it, you could be a lawling, you could be a legalist, they think it's for the other person. Each of you, I can always guarantee you, thinking that's not me, I'm not really like that. And I'm not saying that you are completely like that, but what I'm saying is the seeds of legalism are sown inside our soul from a very early age. And the end of it is in Mark 7, 6 to 8. Don't, don't go there now, you can look it up later if you want. But Jesus says this about the lawlings that had allowed it to bear complete, comprehensive fruit in their lives. They, they're at the far end of the, the lawling kind of trajectory. He said... Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the human traditions. Words, actions, but the heart, far from God. It's all about I press on towards the goal. I it forgets what the goal is. Jesus, the Son of God himself, stands in the midst of all these do-gooders and they do not recognise him. The very person they thought they were trying to please, they had comprehensively missed. And that should just make us all go, whoa, I need a little bit of self-awareness from the Holy Spirit because if those seeds are allowed to grow and flourish in us, that is what Jesus will say to us. Hypocrites, your hearts are far from me. The lawling view, the lawling approach makes doing stuff almost the end state, the, the, the goal. It becomes the terminus. It's like, and I, you can almost call it commandment idolatry. It's like, just keep doing stuff. What did Paul say about all this? Really interesting. He's actually talking about all the lawling stuff, okay? In verse 8 of chapter 3, verse 7, sorry. Whatever were gains to me, so he's talking about all the law and doing the stuff, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Wait a minute, Paul, all that, that work and effort, you're saying was loss? Verse 8, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, Lord for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage. Imagine all the effort it was to chase down Christians in his zeal for the Lord. Imagine all the effort it was to, to keep the laws. To you know, this, this doesn't mean that he didn't sin, guys. What it means is when he did sin, he went in accordance with the law, made sure there were right sacrifices made. He did it every time, as, as he understood it. And now he says, at the end of his life, you know what? I consider that garbage. And I'm going to put a strong image up here, okay? because the Greek word is not actually garbage. It will it is, in one sense. It's excrement. Now, some people don't like that and you know they don't like strong images, but I saw this on the road. It's dog poo, right? I went around it. I hate getting dog poo on my feet. I always seem to find it. I don't know why. I always find those little bombs out in the yard. Um, hanging the washing out the other day, found another one. Um, now, I'm not putting up there just for the shock value for no reason. I'm putting it up there because I know you're all looking at it and go, that is disgusting. It is disgusting. So if you are tempted to stay in room number one 
in the lawling room, right, looking at yourself, looking at others, forgetting the love of God, the love for God, the love for Jesus, watch out, it is the poo room. It is literally the poo room. It is, like, but it doesn't seem that way, does it? And I really want you to keep this image when you, because I know this, I know the Holy Spirit will show us when we're like this, right? And I'm going to get on more of this in a minute. So, but I just want you to hold that. It, it is just, it stinks. I'll just go back to the slide again. Uh, I have lost all things. I consider them excrement for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So, he has this surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus. This makes all that other stuff look like poo. How cool then is Jesus? How wonderful is Jesus? How beautiful is Jesus? That's the point. There's another room as well, um, which Sandy brought out. And she talks about being relieved. And go and ask her about this. And just, again, as a little side note or a footnote, it's, um, it's really great, guys, to interact and it's really great to share because oftentimes, you know, you guys say things or you might send me things. I don't really think about that. And oftentimes it's the Lord saying, this is what I want you to preach on or this is where I want one of the other guys to preach or this is what we need to study. So I really encourage you to interact like that because there are things that, you know, I just don't get at times or I don't understand. And even with this stuff, I know that I might get some of it wrong. And, but isn't it great to be part of a family where we can help each other? So anyway, so she says, she talks about how she was in the wrong room and then, she was called out to the right room where we relied on God to do the work. And what a sense of relief. The condemnation was gone. Grace reigned. I left the ought brigade. Ought to do this, ought to do that. And moved into the second room. Determined never to go back to the first room. However, maybe this is where some of us are at. I certainly have been there. We'll probably have to fight to get out of there again in the future if we're realistic. However, as I dwelt in the second room for some time, it has become apparent that something is not quite right here either. The scriptures say that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works which were before ordained and we should walk in them. Yes, I have experienced that the Lord has changed me. God has given me a new heart, a new mind. But when there is the Lord's work to be done and I'm tired, stressed, cold, hot or anything, too often... This has the priority, and I say to myself that I would like to do what I know the Lord would have me do, but I still choose to please the flesh. So, are any of you guys like empathising with that? So, a call goes out to go fencing, or a call goes out just to bring a meal, or a call goes out just to change some part of your heart or whatever in, in, in God's strength, and you. I know I should want to, but I don't. Like, is it just me, is it? <laughs> like, I don't know, I just think about it and I think about, I press on towards the goal. So what will a room two person think of, I press on towards the goal? I'm going to call this the lounge room. It's the, it's the lounge room view, so we're kind of, we're resting, we've heard about God, maybe we watched about him on metaphorical TV. Looks great. It's all up here. Um, we've even got sophisticated ways of, of justifying our what could be you know spiritual rest, but it could also be spiritual laziness. We know we're called to do good things, but we go, no, that's just legalism. I won't have you put the law on me. Maybe you're right, but then again, you could be wrong. You could just be being a lazy lounge room sludge guts Christian. And you look at press on towards the goal, and you go, yeah, well, if the Lord moves in me, then that's when I'll do it. And yet, when Paul is writing this, he is calling to the church, to them to press on towards the goal as well. God is telling you to do it. Not me, not anyone else. I remember when we went to Junction View and Gabby put together a fencing video. And at the end, I think she put a verse, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was, you know, in, in as much as you've done it to the least, you've done it unto me. And a person queried and came up to me later on. It's kind of funny when you start preaching for a long time because you get, you get a lot of critiques, shall we say. Some are constructive, some are not. And this particular one was, you were putting me under the law. Well, I didn't even put the verse up there, mate. Um, my daughter, who was probably, what, 14 or 15 or something, I asked her to put this, uh, the presentation together and then I said, think of, and she said, what verse you want? I said, well, you go away and pray about it and think about 
there what verse to put on there. So she put that verse up there, and this particular gentleman, who I actually love and respect in the Lord, thought I was putting the law on him. Well, here's the thing, okay? Junction View had a real need. Now, they think of us fondly, and we told them over and over again that the love of Christ compels us. So hopefully they think about Christ fondly as well. We had many opportunities to share the gospel. But if it had been in a sophisticated way, I won't have you put the law on me, the fences don't get fixed. Christ's name down there doesn't get glorified. It's not about putting you under the law. God has created good works. Now, it's funny because Peter's been reading through Revelation, and so have us, so have I. And in Revelation, in the first seven churches, the seven churches, which I think, did you visit any, Rocky? Which one did you visit? Yeah, so again, historical in Turkey right now, modern day Turkey is where these churches are. Just about every single one of these churches, Jesus says, I know your, your good thoughts. I know, yeah, I know your deeds. We then have the parable of the sheep and the goats. What is the difference between the sheep and the goats? What they did and didn't do. And you know what's really, really convicting about that? It's what they did and didn't do to who? The least of these, but who ultimately? Jesus, the king. How terrifying is that? It's designed to be terrifying. Don't theologize that away. Now we know, we know that from the heart is where all this stuff flows. We need God to give us a new heart. In fact, we need God to change our hearts. Now, Paul here as well talks about the people and I guess the train smash at the end of that trajectory. And again, I'm not saying that we're there, but I'm saying that the seeds are there. This is what Paul says about the wrestlings or the wantlings, he calls them, in the lounge room. He says, in verse 18 of chapter 3, I've told you before, and I now tell you again, even with tears. Paul loved his church and loved the church so much that he'd often cry. You'll see many times where he cries about his church. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. What's the problem here? They're living in denial of suffering, of taking up the cross, of denying themselves. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. That means literally desires. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Jude, we read last night, the family also talks about these kind of wantlings. They just do what they want and what the end of that trajectory is. It's people that are like clouds without water. So they have the promise of rain. It's a drought. They have the promise of rain. Nothing happens. They're like autumn trees uprooted. So autumn trees don't bear fruit. Okay. Now they're also uprooted. And though they say they are Christians, they are fruitless, waterless. And Jude wanted to encourage his readers about the salvation. He wanted to say good salvation things and encourage them. He said, no, I've got to warn you about that. Don't just be a thinker. You need to be a doer as well. And then his brother, because Jude was the brother of Jesus and so was James. James takes up that very thing. And even Martin Luther, as in the original one, he, he didn't like the gospel. Of, uh, sorry, the letter of James. He called it a right for epistle along with Ruth, he didn't really believe it should be in the canon. Why? What is, what is, why didn't he like, help me out, Roger, why didn't he like James? Because in there he says things like, show me your works and I'll show you my faith. So, show me your works by your faith. And Martin Luther just couldn't put that together because he, for so long, preached faith, justified by faith, and then he's got James saying, yeah, but wait a minute, Flowing out of your faith, out of your dependence, out of your love, out of what God has done for you will be good works. Otherwise, it's a dead faith. Simple as that. I encourage you this week to read James and maybe read the parable of the sheep and the goats and maybe read Jude. The problem with room two is that we are pressing on towards my goal. Now, we might not feel like we're pressing on anyone's goal, but we're not pressing on towards God's goals, Jesus' goals, kingdom goals, well, there's only one other option. It's our goal. We're at theological rest because of our knowledge, but spiritually we're bankrupt. Like I said, we could call this the wantling view. It could be sophisticated, catch in theological speak, but deep down, when we don't do and then say, sorry, when we don't say, wrong, I'll start again. 
When we say and don't do, we are, think of a tree uprooted, bearing no fruit. Now, Paul was a rester in Christ, but he was also a fruit bearer, a hard worker. In these verses, he talks about straining as an old man. So what hope is there for us? We've got, I press on towards the goal, and we've got these tendencies. Again, I'm not saying we're fully this, but I'm telling you these tendencies will kill your faith. They will kill Christian community because it leads to self-righteousness, judgmentalism, or just an apathy towards God and His holiness, a laziness, a lack of priorities, which then shows there's a lack of reality of Jesus in your life. Is there a, is there a third room? And um, I was a little bit, well, not teary, but yeah, a little bit sad because at the bottom, I don't think Daniel or mommy's sharing, but she said, if there's a third room, show me the door. Look up. And I'll just be honest with you, it's not these two rooms and these two ways of looking thing, looking at things, I'm not saying that I've solved it here. Okay? But as I've thought about it, Sandy gave me this back in October and I've thought about it since I prayed through it and looked in the word. Um, I think the key to understanding whether there's a third room and where the door is is understanding what the goal is. Okay? And again, I don't know if I got this exactly right. Um, but it seems that way, just having been through Philippians and other parts of the Bible. Well, let's have a look. So what's the goal? What's the goal of a lawling and a wantling? What are those tendencies? Well, let's look at these. Now, look at these again with me, guys. Do you notice a theme? I notice a theme. You're Christians? Yes. Most of it is about me. Even the help others is actually going to make you feel good, so you go and do it. Okay? The theme there is that, well, it's all about me, which means there's something missing. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're all religious people. We're religious people. Let's, let's try this one. This is written by uh, Bishop John H. Vincent quite some time ago. But every morning of the new year, I'll, I'll read it. I will this day try to live a simple, sincere, and serene life, repelling promptly every thought of discontent, anxiety, discouragement, impurity, and self-seeking, cultivating cheerfulness, magnanimity, magnanimity, charity, the habit of holy silence, exercising economy and expenditure, carefulness in conversation, diligence in appointed service, fidelity to every trust, and a childlike trust in God. You cannot fault that theologically, can you? Can you? But what, again, what's missing? Well, this is what Paul wrote. Now, just keep that in your mind. Okay? Philippians 3, 8. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And down to verse 10. I want to know Christ. This is the verse that Peter brought out before. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ. In your Bible, even if it's a pretty Bible and a leather-bound Bible with really expensive paper, you should right now get out a highlighter or whatever <laughs> writing implement you have and circle it, underline it, um, highlight it if you've got a highlighter. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. So in your New Year's resolutions, helping others, learning something new, getting rid of weight, or the resolution to be diligent in appointed service and fidelity to every trust. I want to know Christ. Do you, you see the, the contrast? So the lawling in room one, I press on towards the goal. I, big I, the wantling or the wrestling in room two is all about kind of my goals and these tendencies pull within us. You can read about that in Romans uh, 7, I think it is. Even though we've got this new nature, this old nature pulls at different, different extremes. I press on towards the goal in Christ. Do you see that last bit of it? In Christ. In Christ. That literally means like you're living in him, you're abiding in him. Sound familiar like John 15? Now, all of you are kind of, I can sense that I'm starting to lose a bit because I'm going on. And yet I'm at the most, but you're always so keen then. <laughs> Be careful, though. See, now you'll start looking. Um, that's what happened. 
But I just, I, I, don't, I don't want to be the big preacher guy. Here. You know, like I just, I want to, Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. Okay. It's then that he goes on and he talks about, I haven't achieved all this. The goal for him is Christ. So if you want to be in the living room, your goal in all the stuff that you do, in all the stuff that you learn, in all the stuff and the ways in which you serve, is that you might know Christ. So you notice where he says, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection. You like that one? The fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. So that isn't just you know extreme sufferings like ISIS-type martyrdom sufferings. That is literally going and doing the fencing when you don't want to, denying yourself, because that's where Christ is. Even in your sufferings, like your suffering, the idea is that, okay, there's a bit of suffering over here. That's where Jesus is. I'm following Jesus. I'm going to where he is. And the suffering is denying yourself. It's giving up things. This is all part of room uh, three living, the living room. But it is all in Christ. It is all through the power of his spirit. It is even, in fact, you know what? Let me just go through some kingdom resolutions that come from Philippians and let's look at them from a room three perspective because I just think this is the best way to... So I, I can't give you all the outlines, all the contours of, of what room three looks like. But this is kind of illustration. So kingdom resolution one from Philippians 1.11 is that he says, we'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. So resolution one must be to gain Christ. If you think you know Christ and you haven't in your heart bowed the knee, confessed your sin, repented, you haven't yet gained Christ. Okay? If he isn't like a glow in your heart, like a warmth, like a like someone that you love more than anyone you love on earth, like you need to gain Christ. Okay? Examine yourself in that. Okay, but room one's going, try harder. Just try harder to gain Christ. Room three is going, well, when Christ wants me to gain Christ, he'll come along and do so. Well, room three is saying, oh God, actually I don't feel anything for you right now, but you are powerful and strong. You could penetrate the fog of my heart, the hardness of my heart. Would you please do it? Because right now, just be honest with me. Don't do room one and go, oh, holy father, I love you. And I will endeavor this year to love you more. Or, hmm, time to go back to a blog and find out why we can't put anyone under the law. Don't do that. Just pray to the Lord. Lord, maybe there's a verse you're going to show me. Maybe there's a song. Maybe there's a person. Show me what it means to really gain Christ this year, please. You know, Christ is the pearl. He is the great treasure. Any pleasure you have from anything is nothing compared to knowing him. That's look at look at Paul. After all those years of suffering, he still wanted to know Christ. How about this one? Conduct yourself worthy. So Philippians 1, and I'm just summarizing 27 to 30. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So you look back on your life, or you look back on the last week, and you look at yourself and you, you know what? Oh, oh, my heart state in those moments was not right. Well, if you are in Christ, he is not a faceless man to you. you know, his, God is not a faceless man. I was, I was at Meyer down in Canberra and I found the faceless men. I'll post them. I found them. They're in Meyer. They're mannequins. They have no face. <laughs> but I just started thinking to myself, for so much of our experience, God is faceless. And you know, you know why that's bad? Well, I could show everyone's hands except for maybe hairy men. And you won't know who it is. Well, you might, if, you know, from Africa or whatever. But... That is not perfect. If I show you face, you'll know it's Ben straight away, you'll know it's Luke, you'll know it's Terry. Like, you know straight away who it is. But for us, God is just like this kind of faceless force in the sky that we're trying to please. It's not a relational uh, metaphor that we're using in our heads. So when you have not conducted yourself worthy, right, which happens to us all, like children, God will come to us as the Holy Spirit. We go, that was not right. You need to do something about that. Don't harden your heart in that mind, a moment to God. Go, Lord, please, please change me. Please change me from my very core. And Or he might come to you and something will happen. Yeah, I know, I know, but I don't feel it. Well, ask him, is he not powerful to make you feel it, to enable you to feel it? Be unified. And you know what? I'm not going to go through all these. Well, there's 10 of them. 
I'm just going to go through this one, but Philippians 1, verse 27, standing firm in one spirit, contending, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. So it's be unified. I don't, I don't want to be unified though, Lord, because this is third room thinking. I don't want to be unified because that person annoys me. They said things to hurt me. They didn't ex- fulfill my expectations. I feel that I'm entitled to some sort of justice from them. No, Lord. I trust that you will bring justice in the right time. I pray, Lord, that you'll change my heart to truly love them. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Straight away, I'm off to buy the next screen for my computer, or I'm off to do this or do that, or I'm just wanting in an argument to win. Later, God comes as the Holy Spirit, because we're walking in relationship with him, right? It's not economic. It's a relationship, a father, a friend, he says. And he says, Adrian, what, what, what is going on in your heart? And I say, Lord, please change it. But maybe I don't change it now. Maybe I continue to do selfish. Do you realize we're hurting each other now? We're hurting our family. God comes again and he continues to come. He punishes those he loves. He disciplines those he loves. It's not punitive. Restore it. So, easy way or hard way? The hard way will probably come at that point. But in it all, it is in Christ, in his spirit. And for Christ. And I'll go on. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Rejoice in the Lord. Do not be anxious. Pray at all times. Present your request to God in Christ, for Christ, in his spirit. Watch out, um, Paul says. Watch out for those lawling and wantling tendencies. Resolution 8. Press on that we, we already talked about. Straining forward. Heavenward in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's actually Philippians 4 8. Lord, help me to have those thoughts. Help me, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, to want those thoughts. Help me to turn off that movie. Help me to get away from that game. Help me to get away from this destructive thinking. Help me. Change me. Put it into practice. Kingdom resolution number two. Put it into practice. I want to know Christ. Put it into practice. You want to know Christ on Monday morning. You want to know Christ in the middle of the night. You want to know what that means in your relationships. How cool would it be if at the end of this year, like Peter brought out before, you were to look back on 2016 and go, I know you better. I know more of your face. I know more of who you are. I love you. This is the third room. This is the third room. You know, whether something's done legalistically or not doesn't matter at that point because the Lord's going to show me if it's legalistic because I'm walking in relationship with him. It becomes irrelevant. And isn't it funny that the Bible tends to see the whole argument about, you know, room one, room two was just almost irrelevant. In one hand, we're told, don't be like a, don't be like a ghost. Do things. On the other, we're told, rest in Christ. The Bible. It just seems, it doesn't, doesn't seem to matter. Why? Because all the early apostles, early church, knew what it was to walk in relationship with God. That's the third room. That's the living room. That's walking with him, loving him. Like Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. That's the Spirit of Jesus. Now, I'm not going to put up God's seven resolutions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to send them out uh, one day at a time over the next week. Because I want you to know... That whilst I say to you, okay, here, you know, be unified, count yourself worthy, there are resolutions that God has made for you. Okay? I'm going to send them out one at a week, one, one, day, one per day. And I just want you, if you're serious, to go to those verses, read them, pray about them. And then in the middle of the week, meet up with someone, maybe one or two other people. It might just be your wife or your husband or it might be a friend. And say, hey, how are you going with this? What do, you, what do you think about what was said? What do you think about these resolutions that God made towards us? All right? Because ultimately, when we say, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heaven, heavenwards in Christ, in our relationship with him, abiding in him, like we're going to learn about when we go back to
in Christ. I want to know Christ this year. I want to know him. If I've got legalistic tendencies, I want to know that from you, Lord. If I've got just wanting, lazy tendencies, I want to know that, Lord. I want you to continue to work in me and work out of me your salvation. We're told in Philippians that he is at work in us to will and to act according to his good purpose. So he has put his will in us. Ask the Lord this week what system blockages there are to that. Ask him to show you. And let's, let's just love him more this year. Let, let's know him more. Let's see, see how cool he is. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to be together and remember him.